Yeah. Hi, hello, I am Patty. And I'm Jackie, and together we are Grow Live, where we answer your farm and garden questions and offer gardening knowledge of the best practices weekly. Our mission is to help you and others to grow a healthier world, one question at a time, to one gardener at a time. Our goal is to help you be successful in growing healthy food and creating a healthier planet. Yes, that's right, Jackie. And I am so excited about what we got going on this week. Awesome. Well, what are we talking about this week? So, well, I've been getting a lot of questions. And so I thought we better address those questions. And then I wanted to go over um, some planning of the gardens. Cool. And yeah, some of the questions relate to that as uh, what we should or shouldn't be thinking or doing. You know, since I was on the road this week, I was with the state FFA, which is the Future Farmers of America convention this week, which is the first live convention we've had for a while because we didn't have one in 2020. And, uh, but anyhow, I have to eat on the road when I'm down traveling. And so I did woke up this morning and I'm like, I am detoxing this morning. So carrot juice and apples it was with a little bit of beets. Are those carrots you grew? I had to buy store-bought carrots for the first time since last June this week. How'd that go? I'm eating Mike's carrots. Um... They were not anywhere near as tasty as Mike's carrots. Yeah. They were even, I even splurged on organic ones. Yeah. We yeah, that's why, that's one of the reasons why we're here, Jackie, to help people learn better how we can get um, more nutritious food and get that flavor. So I got a little picture up here of a high tunnel. And I'll, I'll probably get some more pictures here to uh, high tunnel. So that's what I did last, uh, the last few days before I went to Billings is uh, resheet the high tunnel. So quite the event, right? So this was the old cloth. And I thought, well, you know, the traditional way is to, to tie tennis balls on a, on a rope, then attach the rope to plastic, throw the tennis ball over the hoop house, oh. to pull off the tarp. And I'm like, well, right there's the tarp, no wind. And I'm like, I'm just going to duct tape the new tarp to the old tarp. <laughs> so we did that. The people helping me were like, okay, now we really know this lady's crazy. There's no way in the world this is going to work. But uh, we were successful and it worked. And so there it is, the new tarp on that high tunnel. But uh, my point back to where Lori's at is um, to go from inside where we're in 70 degree weather in our grow lights to want to go outside where this is outside and it's pretty cold you know 25 degrees this morning granted it warms up nice beautiful during the day but then back to those 20s at night and so there is some things coming up and growing but those have a established root system and can tolerate cold our little seedlings aren't necessarily that right now Right, so they, their future may be that, but right now that it's not that. <clears throat> so, but in this picture, you can see this little box. That's a traditional um, cold frame. And it's just a window over, a, I don't know, it's maybe a 12 inch um, boards around there. And that's had um, stuff growing in it successfully. Now that's not able to be eaten yet, but they're not dying. Right, and so they're acc and they're acclimated. So you could do something like that, which would help you um, be able to acclimate them from our warm to our cold in this big swing of hot cold during the day, from cold to really warm. So even in in this little high tunnel, I have to open this box up in the afternoon, otherwise it gets too hot in there. You know. So those are some ideas, but a lot of the market growers are using a, <clears throat> a reme cloth. And so they've just put um, little hoops over their planting rows or where we're gonna put our planting trays and put the reme cloth over the top of them. And it's just a thin cloth um, barrier, but it breathes. 
And so that eliminates the sprotum of me needing to open that glass every day because this cloth is breathing. And so you could do that. I know growers that have remake cloth and a second layer of plastic inside the greenhouse as a second layer of protection. And they're not having to do much. Now you're not having to water a lot either, not, not like normal because it's just the plants aren't using much water. Mike thinks what I did wrong with the broccoli starts that I actually put outside in a bed mm -hmm. was when I put the cloth over them, I didn't make sure it wasn't touching them. And he thinks because it was touching them, they froze and I should have made sure there was like an air pocket space. Yes, yes we want to have an air pocket space. You can do that with hoops or you can do see those large planters in there. You could set them up and lay the cloth over the, that and then put some bricks on the cloth to hold it above the plant. Yeah, you don't want the cloth or the plastic touching the plant. So those are a couple of things we don't want to do, but that little ad additional protection should get it. Now, if it goes to 20 degrees instead of 25, Mm, I'm not sure, but I do know our grower down in Livingston, she's been growing greens all winter long, and she's doing it in a high tunnel with remake cloth, but those plants were planted last fall, right? So the big difference between that root ball being well-established and our little seedlings, but that's a start. Um, for myself, I have that to do any protection in the high tunnel or a greenhouse, or definitely not a greenhouse, but High tunnel will be questionable, just depends on how cold it really gets at night. So that's what I'd suggest. Because your mustard green, like I put out snapdragons and zinnias that are just really tender. My arugula is still growing out like- Shelter is freezing at night or not, then you'll know how much covering you, you would need to do. Kale is one of them that I was thinking could go maybe go out and then I've got um, some spinach and arugula and cilantro and dill. I was wondering, you know, like- Oh, dill, dill you can probably put out with no problem. I would think you put all that stuff out. How about onions? Onions, yes. So, okay, so this is gonna get back to a little bit more of what our slideshow presentation is gonna be about. And so let's look at this. I would what is growing, right? So this is in the greenhouse of Sleeping Buffalo. That's Borge, loves cold weather, right? It's sprouting everywhere. So I'm like, it is time to plant Borge. Next week when the bee friend sprouts, I'm gonna say it's time to plant what? Bee friend. My onions are already got some green tops coming outside, no protection. So, what time is it? Time to plant us some onions. Somebody asked me, I think that's in one of our questions coming up, um, is it time to plant potatoes? I kind of like to leave a few potatoes in the ground over the winter and wait, if they're mulched, wait and see when they come up. When they start sprouting, what do I plant? Potatoes. If I don't do that, I've, I don't know how many times I've done that where I like, oh yeah, it's early April, I'm gonna plant the potatoes. I plant those potatoes and um, they rot in the ground and it's too cold a soil for them to grow. So if they're not gonna be ready to grow, I don't put them out there. So same way, let a few tomatoes go to, you know, go to seed on the ground. When they sprout, then it's time to plant what? tomatoes. So it's very simple, but you do need to leave some stuff out in your environment that will sprout and come up and, and uh, grow to give you these hints of what, what would nature do. So that's what I would suggest the most is to go with that. But onions, yes. What else we got, Jackie? Um, how far apart should I plant my corn? Okay, um, yeah, and corn, the world of corn is changing. I grew up in corn country and 
man, we had 30 inch rows. Some years we went to 24 inch rows and back to 30 inch rows. And then the cover crop guys come along and the poly crop guys start thinking and they're like, why are we planting the corn and the beans on different years? Or why are we putting in a cover crop and not having a crop that pays for itself? So they decided we're gonna go with 60 inch corn row. 60 inches apart from one corn row to the next corn row. And then in the middle, they decided, yeah, let's put in our beans or let's put in the cover crop. And they did. And guess what happened? They were successful. <laughs> that corn loved that extra space. And that extra help from those other microbes working with those other plants. And their production didn't go down on 60 inch rows. So as gardeners, what do I, what do you think we should try? Let's try a little bit of it and see. What was the Native Americans doing? Was they tilling up enough area that they could put a plant every 30 inches of corn? Hmm. No, they did not, right? Theirs were way more spread out than what ours for the last 50 years has been tradition. Yeah, so let's go with, let's try that and see. And what do we want to mulch though, right? Everything needs to be mulched where there's not a target plant. Okay, what else do you think, Jackie? Anything else we got? So we've got some planning to do but you here. You can't put corn in until after danger of frost, right? Oh yes, that's one of the other questions too, right? When, when to plant corn? Yes. So in Michigan, which is zone five, lots warmer than here, um, they want their corn in by May 15th, but they don't want to start until the 1st of May. <laughs> so that window is pretty tight. You want to get that soil warmed up. You don't want to have it emerge and go through a lot of frost. You don't want it to emerge and then get into heavy rains and set in water. All those things destroy corn. So why not wait? In Montana, I would think let's put corn in right before the tomato. That's first of June. So the end of May, if I think I was really anxious, is when I would go in with that corn. Um, put your hand in the ground, figure it out. If it's warm, plant. If it's not, don't. But, you know, we get restricted by our time. Like, I've only got this weekend to put it in, or I got to put it in tonight, or I can't get it in. So those are some of our restraints that um, causes some issues. Um, I'll tell you this story really quick. Last year, we was working with a community group of people and they were supposed to, they had their own tomatoes and they were supposed to plant their own tomatoes. And one thing led to another. Pretty soon it was late May. Pretty soon it was June. Every weekend went by. They didn't plant the tomatoes. And I'm like, well, it was June 15th. They still aren't planting tomatoes. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to stick all these tomatoes in that I had extra and just stick them in and see what happens. My other tomatoes were already had a two week head start on them. And those tomatoes were by far the best garden tomatoes, not high tunnel tomatoes or greenhouse tomatoes, but best garden tomatoes ever by starting. The last ones you put in? June 15th. Mm -hmm. The soil Does it also depend on like, if you have a 55 day corn compared to a 120 day corn, like when it's gonna be harvested? Cause I know Mike has done a lot of trying to find a corn that grows really good in cold weather. Like we ordered some from that Bill McDormand who got some from Siberia. And those are the seeds that he uses that Mike has saved because that corn is the shortest season corn he can find um, for growing wise, because we, our corn window is really small. Like he didn't get yes. his corn in last year. Yeah, I agree. When I was at Rock Creek, we, uh, which is way higher elevation, way colder in a creek, right? So the cold weather drops into the low spots. So I had a very short window to grow corn in, and um, I'd say nothing short of 80 days, or nothing longer than 80 days in that scenario. 
And that means 80 days from the time the plant emerges and its soil is warm enough for it to grow. Because if it emerges and it sets there in cold soil for two weeks, the calendar, the dates really have, the time hasn't really started. So, yep, go shorter to be successful and try that and see how it goes. That was okay. a big tip you taught me this year that I didn't know before. The days are from when it comes out of the ground. I had no idea that that made a difference. Well, low spots. So I had a very short window to grow corn in and um, I'd say nothing short of 80 days or nothing longer than 80 days in that scenario. And that means 80 days from the time the plant emerges and its soil is warm enough for it to grow. Because if it emerges and it sets there in cold soil for two weeks, the calendar, the dates really have, the time hasn't really started. So, yeah, go shorter to be successful and try that and see how it goes. That was okay. a big tip you taught me this year that I didn't know before. The days are from when it comes out of the ground. I had no idea that that made a difference. Well, or I always thought it was the day you planted it that's from the day it comes out of the ground. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, traditionally that's what we're taught to think and that's what we think, but I think it makes more sense to just pay attention to what's coming up and, you know, how can it grow before it germinates? So, can I ask one more? What about sweet alyssum? You said I need that oh. alyssum and I found two packets of it. Does that have to wait till after frost or can I put that out? No, it's cold season and I bet when this, uh, when the bee friend comes up, the sweet alyssum will be coming up. In fact, there was sweet alyssum coming up in the sleeping buffalo greenhouse a month and a half ago, but then we went to 25 below zero. <laughs> Believe me, that decided it trimmed it right back like, no, it is not spring yet, <laughs> but it is a cold season and it's pretty hardy. I got up and we had got... So I just kind of yesterday kinda... I got up and we had got hail right before we went to bed the night before, and there was hail and frost, and there were like puddles of like like ice cubes in different <laughs> spots down in the garden all over the place. There were other spots that were okay. So that mm -hmm. also makes a big difference. Like we have so many little microclimates between Mike's mini farm and my garden beds, and even like the sunniest spot in our garden compared to places that don't get sun first thing in the morning and don't get sun late in the afternoon. Like it really depends on where the sun is. Yes. Yeah. Big, big difference. We'll talk about that here in a second to get further into that, but I got a question for you guys. I, um... Maybe you guys can put your answer in the chat. It'll work. What, what's the number one most important thing to you? Number one. I don't know what you mean. Like, what's the number one most number important one thing most that important I grow in my you, garden no, this in year? Your, no, in your world, in your life, for you, for you personally, what's the most important thing? My husband? In the world. Okay, put it in the chat. Yep. Maybe, maybe your husband. Maybe my son. To be happy and strong. Oh, my health. That's a good one. What's our, what's our answers? Lori says to be happy and strong. Yay. I wrote my husband. What's yours, Patty? Before I got educated or after? Today, it's right now, at this very moment. Right here. That's the number one important thing to me. Zero? Oxygen. Oh, Oxygen. Sure. Because if I can't breathe, how long do, do I have if I don't have oxygen? Not less, very long. Less than three minutes, right? <laughs> so if I can't get oxygen and fill up my lungs and function in my body, it doesn't matter how much I love my son or my garden or anything. That oxygen is the number one important, most important thing on earth to you is that oxygen. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about garden designing because this oxygen is super important, right? 
is our number one health thing because without it, we don't have time to worry about going without water for three days because we can only go through three minutes without that oxygen. So let's go with the water first. So, or the air first. So this is relaying back to our crabgrass. Surprise, it goes back to our soil. So in this slide is what I teach the kids at school. This is from the University of British Columbia. Um, under normal growing conditions, we're over here 50% um, minerals and organic matter, 25% air, and 25% water. That's, I, I would have to say that's more ideal. Who's growing in ideal conditions today in, in the United States? Not me. In the world. Yeah, well, neither is most of the farmers. And majority of all gardeners, I'd have to say probably aren't either, right? Because we've got these other problems going on. So when we have compaction, a um, few things that causes compaction, one is our tillage, right? Our tillage breaks up the structure of the soil, destroys the soil life's work, and then they got to rebuild it all. Right, and so it collapses. Those air pockets, remember our slide with our soil aggregate last week? These little pockets where we see little dips of blue throughout the aggregate, and even in here, because this is under a giant microscope, those pockets collapse. Now there's not any room for air. And there might not be if it dries out and there isn't any room for air. Now we get nothing but compaction, everything just collapses on itself, right? And then only certain plants can grow in that compacted state. Unfortunately, they're ones we don't want, but we, we always point a finger at, it's the plant, it's, the, it's a weed, it's the problem. But no, the weed was the messenger. The problem is we don't have any air in our And as soon as you get done broad forking, then you wanna add in um, food and water for the microbes because they're going to keep the air pockets opened up and keep the air in there. So same way when we have poorly drained soil is now it now that those air pockets fill up with water and suppress those pockets out and now it's just water and water sogged. We have different plants that grow in those conditions than we do our air condition, our air problem. So let's see, what do we want to write? Here's some of those plants. So ideal, look at this, isn't that sweet? Right, so that ideal condition, she, this lady can grow anything. She deems to grow in our micro zone, in our climate. Is that, then, what is that? This is corn, and then she's got, uh, beans, marigolds, and the whole gamut after that in there. So are you saying I should be breaking up that quack grass with the broad fork? Mm-hmm. Aerate it. Because I smothered it with straw. Yep. No, you can smother it with straw after you aerate it. Go in there with the broad fork with the straw on there and aerate it. Um. So when I when you say aerate it with the broad fork, but don't turn it over, just like poke holes in it. Gently poke some holes in poke it. Poke holes and water. give it a little rock that, that will put air in the soil. Right. But then you need to feed the microbes. As soon as you get that air in there, you gotta feed those microbes to keep that air, keep that opened up and get them going to work. And then some of our water logging problems, which we don't have, but there's people, the farmers have got it. We're, we'll, we'll grow curly dock and a few other plants that just love water log soils. Okay, what's the number two now important thing to you? I think I gave you some hints. Definitely agree, right? I gave you some pretty big hints though once we moved to the air. <laughs> well, you had those diagrams. <laughs> Lori said, we learn fast. <laughs> yes, I love that. I love fast learning. Dark great teacher. So, yeah, 
So yes, now it's water is the most important thing, right? And guess what? The microbes say the same thing, that water is the most important thing. They're aquatic. They got to have it. So air and water, that's our goal and for right now. So this is what happens when um, we had a rain or we got to soil. What is that a picture of? Is that, that is, soil cracking? That's crusted, 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 they call it, crusted soil. Because, so this Ooh. is a farm field. No and way. That looks like broken up plastic. Yeah, this is a giant problem in agriculture because they're using, they're doing no-till practices, which is fine to do no-till practices, but above the no-till drill, in with the no-till drill, they are planting their seed and they usually have, and for the last 40 years, they have these shovels on their air seeder. And the shovel is almost like tilling the surface, the top four inches of soil. And so that soil in the top four inches has gotten so broken up from this tillage and they're no cover, right? They don't have any cover. They don't have any cover on this soil, which is mulch or composted materials or just stubble because the microbes have already ate it all, right? They ate all that stubble that was there the year before. And so now the microbes don't have anything to eat. So right? is this picture under the microscope or that's just a regular? This is the real picture. Like you could walk right across that. And the, is that what they mean when they're like constantly talking about the armor? I hear everybody. This is the lack of armor. <laughs> this is the lack of armor. Oh. One of the things that happens a lack of armor. All right. So this is, this happens where a farmer plants, Say we plant corn and then we get a rain and maybe worse yet, it's a heavy rain for a day or so. And then, th then the sun comes out and now this is what we get. It's like baking clay on top of our soil surface, which really it is. But what's happened is the bacteria, as soon as the water and air drop out of the soil, enough that they start getting worried. Because what happens if your husband comes in and says, oh, by the way, I'm turning the water off so I can plumb for the next 24 hours in an hour. What are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do? Draw water and get water and use it as fast as you can use it and stock it up. Because now I know I'm going to be without water for 24 hours. So the biology does the same thing. So they're getting that water glued inside those aggregates and they're gluing themselves to the soil particles in this situation, because we don't have much organic matter in this situation. They're gluing themselves to the soil particle and what they glue themselves with is a waxy substance. It's got a heavy wax coat over the top of it because the microbe doesn't want to wash off in the next rain and it doesn't want to blow away in the next wind event. So it's gluing itself to the soil in hopes that it's going to stay there. And when things get back to more normal, then they can go back to work again. But that waxy surface, you see how this kind of looks like it was shiny before it baked. When this first happens, when that water first hits that field, it almost looks like a slick ice, ice skating rink. And that's that waxy coat, coating that whole surface. And it's actually making the soil, if the soil was already dry when the rain event come, it made the soil hydrophobic, hydro water phobic scared. It's scared of the water. So it repels the water. So you dig underneath this, this, um, field here, it would not be very wet because it got repelled. So uh, complicated, right? But if we, uh, we keep a mulch on top of the soil, which you have with your straw, right? But we got to get some air in that soil.
we got to start figuring out how to deal with these things, right? So those microbes, though, they they need the air and the water to live, and the bacteria is the ones that can live with the biggest problems. And so the bacteria are there gluing this stuff together. And the fungi and the protozoa, all those cool guys I showed you last week, they just went dormant. Or they die, one of the two. Hopefully they go dormant, right? So you can bring them back. But they, they are not going to handle this abuse that we keep pumping out. And then, unfortunately, the farmer sprayed some herbicide on this, these fields before we got to the state, probably. So now we got chemical on there, too. So, but that's uh, some of the story of what's going on out there. But let's talk about what we can do to help us with this water situation, because we got a lot of people right now, Jackie, that are just starting to plan their garden for the very first time that they haven't gardened before. And so location and and how we do this is gonna be really important. So this is what, right outside my patio, and this is a traditional, what you'd think of a kitchen it's garden. Really pretty. And so using permaculture techniques, you're gonna put what you use the most closest to your door. So in this situation, what I'm using the most is my herbs and my mint because I drink mint tea every day. So those are the closest to my door. So that has to go into the planning. And then more important yet, yeah, where's the water source, right? Because these plants and these microbes need to have water. So when we want to have a consistent supply of water because this up and down of some water, not enough water, too much water, all of that's not good, right? We want a consistent supply of water. So this is really close to my water hose and all good. So the next thing you might want to think about, and those planters put together with this technique, this is a German technique called a Hugo culture. And so you literally bury wood in the ground and in this situation it was in those planters. So the bottom of those planters is full of wood and some wood chips before I put any soil in it. And then I buried that wood and then I started, um, then I mulched the soil and then I planted. So that's making this wood, what happens when wood gets wet? It's punky, right? And it kind of swells up. And that actually is giving soil fungi a fantastic home to get established in and say, this is heaven on earth. Well, fungi can deliver 20% of the water needs to the plant all by themselves without anything else going on. So now I've increased my water by 20% and decreased my demand of me doing it by 20% just by burying this wood under the planter or in your growing beds. So this is an example of some long growing beds. This is from, I think, um, garden.org. So these are some long hugels that they've built. And now it's also the, the mountain effect, I call it, where that we have two sides and a top in the ends, when before all we had was the flat plane. Do we have more surface that we can grow on? Yeah, we've, we've more than doubled the surface. We may be two thirds more of the surface to grow on just by putting in a hugo. The next thing to think about is making swales. So I think I've told you before that I water my greenhouse, my high tunnel, once the high tunnel, not the greenhouse, well, high tunnel, once every 10 days. How can I do that, right? That seems like, oh, she must be crazy. No, it's once every 10 days because I built swale pathways and the swale needs to be on contour. So when I contoured out the land, I had a little bit of degree slope from one corner of the high tunnel to the other corner. 
And so then I dug out where I wanted my foot pathway. I dug it out and then I put um, branches of wood in it. And then some, then I buried them. I threw in a little bit of soil. Then I buried them in wood chips. And so I have a wood chip walkway. When you walk in the high tunnel, you think that's just a wood chip pathway. It appears to be so, but it's also my floodplain, right? So I put the hose at the top end, the upper end of that swale, turn it on trickle and let it fill that pathway up. Well, now that's seeping that moisture into the growing bed that's on the lower side of it, which is where all my plants are growing. And so I have three of those in this little mini high tunnel. So it goes back to when I set the greenhouse up in the first place, right? A lot of people understand, oh, I need to orient it so that I get the most sun. Some people orient it so they get wind protection, but we need to orient where's my water and what's downhill. And so those three things are important when we set up the greenhouse or high tunnel in, or the gardens in the first place is to, where's this water gonna flow to, right? I want it to flow to my next bed in my gardens every time. So I may have a three foot pathway, one foot or two foot or 18 inches, whatever, whatever's doable for you pathway and then your row again and do that all the way through the garden. And so you can set it up so you're actually, you could set it up on a like a, a main line with holes in it. So the holes are on each pathway, turn that main line on and let it water for three, four, five hours in your pathways. You flooded the whole thing, but not over flooded anything because that wood is a sponge. And my soil is watered easily four foot deep because I can take the brown rod and just literally sink it right in the ground, four foot deep. Then I don't water anymore. Done watering for 10 days. About seventh day, especially if it's been hot and sunny, I'll go in there with the brown rod and I'll stick it in the ground. Oh, I've got 18 inches of soil moisture left. Do I need to water? Probably not. If I'm gonna leave for a week, would I water? Yes, I'd water again. So you just kind of meter it as to how long am I going to be there on the 10th day when I want to reflood or not. I'd set every garden up that way. Now, when you first walk into my yard, you'd think there was, this is flat. You'd think there's no slope. But there is a one to two degree slope from one corner of my lot to the other corner of the lot. And so I can use that as to my advantage all the way through my garden. So each year I'm starting to add more of these soil pathways because there's already established garden, right? If it's, if you're putting in a brand new garden, no establishment whatsoever, you do this first. It's, it's, it's just priceless. It's beyond the best practice. I can't even say enough about how good this practice is. <laughs> That's what I need to do down in my orchard. Yeah, at your house, Jackie, I would do it from your little growing beds up by your house all the way down the hill, all the way down. Um, that's how they do the terracing, you know, in um, over there in all right. of the, you know, China and even even down there in Chile. That's what they did was the terracing. So the contour, contour I was able to figure out with the easy homemade um, frame. I put the link here to this guy at Permaculture Pennsylvania, Permaculture PA he's called, and he walks you through how to do these um, contour lines. You don't have to buy anything, but have a couple pieces of two by two to be able to make the A-frame and a, preferably a level is faster than plumb line, but I use a plumb line to be able to figure out your contour. Can you share that link in the chat? And then Cleo asks in the chat, what about the drip irrigation system you suggested? Yep. So, I'm thinking that all those branches that the grizzly bear ripped off of our apple trees yeah. would be good wood to put in the bottom of the hugo culture swale. Yes. Yes, exactly. 
Cleo said, what about the drip irrigation? Oh, yep, the drip irrigation is more for a market gardener and I use it, right? But I use it with a timer, right? I don't just set it so it comes on every single day just because I want it to come on. No, not, not in any way, shape or form. I figure out how long it's gonna be from when I run the drip irrigation to the next time it actually needs water. Because you don't want to just keep running water all the time in those beds because then you're going to make a situation where only bacteria, bad bacteria can live and none of our good um, bac bacteria, fungi, protozoa, all the stuff I taught you last week, none of them are living in it. You've just wiped them out by putting in too much water. Okay, so we're walking this tightrope. So I set the drip irrigations up. Um, at the beginning of the year, it's once every three days or twice a week. Um, these are outside beds. Inside the greenhouse, another world, right? Because of way hotter, way more humidity, and no natural rain, and less condensation, unless you're having a lot of temperature swing in that greenhouse. So then in the greenhouse, it may be daily, every morning at four o'clock, they come on, and they have, I have four different runs, or I would prefer you have four different runs. If you have four long, if you have a 72 foot high tunnel or, or bigger, you're, you're gonna have to have at least four runs, right? To be able to get enough water pressure from one end to the other and do what you're doing. So that all has to be planned out. And you do that by measure, you either use a moisture meter or your hand, figure out is it, is it damp or not? So at the end of your line, so you set up, you run, Maybe you're gonna run your irrigation to run for a half an hour. At the end of the half an hour, you go to the far end of your line and find out, is there as much water at the far end of the line as there was at the beginning of the line? If there wasn't, then maybe your lines are too long. So there's just gonna be some figuring out, but what you want it to be is consistently damp. And then later in the season, outside, I may have to go to every other day. By August, and it's hot, there's no rain, it's getting really dry. I may have to be watering every single day. And I do this with a timer, drip irrigation timer. It's an automatic timer, comes on, I program them so they're all done watering before seven o'clock in the morning. I don't water anything after that. Did you see Cleo said, what do you mean by four runs? So each drip irrigation line, drip tubes, that. I've set up at her place is running one line, right, of going down through. Most of the time we got four lines in what we consider one set of beds. So if you got three drip tapes, that's one line. Because it's what you would do for each bed. Uh, so this is a permaculture drawing here. Um, give you an idea of what you might think about. So they, these are their deciduous trees. That's where our fruit tree would be. And then they've got rosemary and oregano underneath of them. Your mints off in a corner somewhere so that you can control them, right? But they're, you're paying attention to where your drip edges are from your tree as to what's getting that moisture and nutrients and then what's not. And it goes back to these microclimates Jackie was talking about. And so, and why are the trees blocking the sun? I that seems odd to me. Doesn't so, rosemary and basil want like super hot this, and warm lavender. This is in the um, in the hot summer. It's too hot, and so they're going to block the sun. The afternoon sun, right, is horrible here. I've I've got such a I've got like a heat tube in my west of my house because there's nothing to block the west sun. The west sun comes all the way down. It just bakes everything to death. So I use sunflowers and fruit trees to block that afternoon sun because if you don't, you're just, you're just fighting nature to all get all, and it's just killing you, and you can't win. By August, you're not winning <laughs> because you don't have any sub moisture and everything's dried up. 
And so, yeah, it's blocking the wind. Those taller plants are blocking the wind and, and shading. I have tall bunch grasses of uh, basin ryegrass. They help block the wind and they, they're building a habitat for beetles that we want in the garden too. So you just kind of strategically think, okay, where, where can I put something that would give my plants a relief from the sun by two o'clock in the afternoon? Because that sun from three to five o'clock at night from the west is brutal. Sometimes till seven, eight o'clock at night, you think this is too brutal. So if it's too brutal for us, it is way too brutal for your plants. So think, I'm out there with no sunscreen, no hat, all day. When would you be ready for some shade? That's when you want to get to your plants some. So these deciduous trees do great at that because come winter, they don't have any leaves on them. And so you're still gaining all the sun you can gain in the winter. But in the summer, they're helping you shade. Okay, we gotta keep rolling and we're gonna run into an hour and a half show. Number three, what's, the, what's now the number three most important thing to you guys? Are we up to food? Oh, are you stealing the show, Jackie? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I think you're right. It has to be food, right? Because <laughs> now we have our oxygen, we have our water, now we have our food. We have those especially if it's healthy, we should have a healthy life, right? Now we're ready for our family and friends and all the rest of the stuff for travel or whatever it is you might want to do, right? So we got to have the food next. So this is a picture from the school salad bar from before COVID, right? COVID took our salad bars away. Then we're really looking forward to getting them back. But yes, food. And so that's what we're going to talk about next week as to how to feed these microbes. But uh, for you that want to stay on the line to deal with how to feed these microbes because of the scribegrass, you can, and we can visit about that. You can join Grow Life on the Facebook page. You can find the Grow Life recordings on YouTube, or sometimes you can get the audio at the Green Organic Garden podcast. You can find more information in the descriptions on YouTube. How do people support us? Yes, they can support us by not only subscribing, that will help. We're starting to gain some subscribers on the YouTube channel and on Jackie's um, oh. podcast downloads, that would help on that too. And you can join us on our Patreon. That would really help. <laughs> Give us a little bit of um, money to move forward with what we're doing and try to expand. At the, at the state FFA convention, I run into a lot of people that um, they're connected to gardening, right? Because they're teaching agriculture and growing food. And so every time I'm around them, I give them a little more um, insight on doing it more naturally. And believe me, they, they fully get it because I presented to them before. So in fact, when I walk through the door, the very first person that's seen me says, oh my gosh, I feel so guilty every time I go to Facebook because I can't afford to buy no-till equipment. <laughs> I says, no, don't feel guilty. I says, you, you got to live within your means. And sometimes you just have to figure out how to, can I tweak what I already have to make it work. But anyhow, uh, we sure hope- no-till equipment? What equipment do they have to buy for no-till? I thought it was the other way around. People were like selling rototillers and stuff. But the big farmers have big equipment and I was with my son a couple weeks ago and we were looking at the big equipment. He was showing me this air drill and the tires on the air drill are literally half the size of my little pickup, the tires. And I'm like, and this was all folded up, you know, it's, they, they're 60 foot wide. When they unfold them, they're 60 foot wide. And I was like, just jaw dropped, I'm like, Holy moly, no wonder there's so much compaction. And so expensive, right? $500,000. It isn't like they're going to go out and say, ah, I'm going to switch. Because what happens when we switch cars unexpectedly? It's going to cost us money, right? And so that's kind of where they're at in big egg. Okay, but for here, for Grow Live, 
We hope to see you soon on a show. And we will be in person here later in the month down in Jordan for a composting workshop. And I think we're going to build us a bio Sioux compost reactor and a compost pile bow. So anybody that can join us, we sure hope you can. That's in Jordan, Montana. I think it is the 24th. Have you heard of Dr. Bronner's, the Castile, you know, the soup, soap? Dr. Bronner's like peppermint soap and do you know what I'm talking about? No, but it sounds good. It, he, so they sent me the book, Dr. Bronner's Unconventional Journey to a Clean, Green, and Ethical Supply Chain. And I've been reading, it's just fascinating. It's all about how they're doing everything you're talking about, like in India and, yep. um, it, oh my gosh, where does he go? Africa and teaching these farmers all the same regenerative and but they're also doing it like he writes from a business perspective how they're managing to make sure these farmers can go from conventional means mm -hmm. and get a fair premium but fair trade practices but they're going through a lot of the same things you're talking about how do we go from the equipment to the small scale farmer using i don't know or even, you know, these guys don't, well, they don't have any choice to, to to be big because there's nobody else to do it. And they're huge, huge farms. Yeah, we're not going to solve the whole world's problems today, but hopefully we can solve some of yours. And so if you've got any questions, please get them to us. Till next week, grow healthy. Um, I think I have a poll. How do I get to that poll? Can you get to the poll, Jackie?